and uh, welcome to our, our teaching series. Uh, it's good to have you with us and um, uh, good to have this opportunity to take some time to read the Word of God together. And we're continuing to look at 1 John and today we're up to 1 John chapter 12 or no, 1 John chapter 12 doesn't exist. We're up to 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 to 12. So uh, get your, your Bibles ready and, and all the rest of it so we can read along together. Um, but before we read from the Word of God, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Gracious God, as we approach your Word now, we pray that you bless us, that you help us to understand, and you help us, Lord God, to see your light and your beauty in what we read. So God be with us in your name. Amen. So as I said, First John chapter 4, uh, beginning at verse 7 and reading down to uh, verse 12. And this is the Word of God. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Amen. Uh, I want to dive straight into this passage today, but firstly I want to make a confession. What I'm going to say uh, today, has, uh, I have said many times before, um, I want a few bits added to it here and there. And the times that I've shared this passage with people tends to be either in, in two forms of service, either a wedding ceremony or a funeral service. And I hope and pray that as I share this, the reason for that will become clear. Uh, the reason that for that is that this is all about love. And I, I enjoy talking about love and not least because it's an amazing feeling, you know, and uh, as a person who is, is married and who is, has fallen in love, uh, you know, I know that it's an incredible feeling. I know that it's something deeper and it's something that goes a lot deeper than nearly anything else that we face or we experience in this life. You know, love is not just a fad. Love is something that is deeper. It goes deeper. It should and, and it does permeate and go right into what we regard as the very depths of our souls. And what John tries to say here to us today is that understanding love is actually the key to understanding God. In this passage, John lays out for us what God's love looks like and what our love should be. The inspiration for love that we share together as a fellowship. And it's a wonderful piece of scripture. It's one of my favourites, in fact, if I have to be honest. I have lots of pieces of scripture that I say are my favourites, don't I? But this really is one. Let's read again those verses 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not know God, lo, bleh, whoever does not love, does not know God, because God is love. So once again, John is is being a wee bit repetitive here because he's appealing to the flock to love one another, and he's asked for that to be the case several times already in this letter. But the reason that he's asked them to love one another really stands out for me. He says that love comes from God, that anyone born of God or anyone who's been regenerated through Christ as a Christian should realise that because of love they know God. He repeats this in verse 8, it's the opposite clause as mentioned, he says whoever does not love does not know God. If just get into that a wee bit here, does that mean that everyone who's ever been in love knows God automatically? Well in a strange sort of way that kind of is the case. See, what John is doing here is he's pointing out that love in and of itself is not a human convention. It's from God. It's his very character. It's all about love. And as we've looked out, looked at in, in, in church before, God's love is not like our own. So people ask, you know, what is it that's different about humans to, to animals? And I often think that we can really boil it down to, I'm not sure that animals have the capacity to love. Now, people say, well, my dog climbs up onto my knee and cuddles itself in, and my dog is, is really, really attentive to me, and my dog is, is this, that, and the other thing, and shows me love in such an amazing way. But that's because your dog is used to you feeding it, walking it, looking after it. 
You see, the love that your dog shows or the, the affection that your dog shows for you comes from a place where it knows it's going to get something, where it knows that there's something that's going to get out of that relationship. Love that comes from God and love that, that is in a, in a human sense is not love that goes seeking like that. Instead, it's, it's, it's something else. It's something deeper. And John is asking his flock to love one another, to show love to one another. I had a conversation with Wallace today, and we got talking about our loving God and how he allows some bad stuff to happen. How is that loving then, we discussed. The reality of God's love is this. It's beyond our what we can grasp or completely understand. In his love, God can see what is 100% good for us, what will bring him the glory, what will be best for our lives and his purposes. And it's God's love that does the unconventional and does the, the unthinkable, if you like. Verses 9 and 10, we see a measure of that. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Well, John was in such a privileged position. You know, He wrote about this love that he saw through Christ firsthand, being one of the twelve disciples who followed Jesus around. He got to see Jesus' love and compassion. He saw the Lord raise those who were sick. He saw uh, him transform lives with a touch, preach and teach a message of hope and victory over sin. And then ultimately take that step for each of us when he carried our sin onto the cross and died for us. He witnessed his victory over death through the resurrection and life to life and knew the significance of it all. He knew that on behalf of us, the Lord had become a man. John witnessed firsthand how Jesus lived a life of forgiveness, even forgiving those who put him to death. He witnessed behaviour from Jesus that is unnatural. Unnatural in the sense that actually you could look at it and say he's too good to be true and yet he is and he was true. His account of God's love is first hand. It's not rumour or hearsay. It's from personal experience. He felt the love of God, saw the evidence of the love of God and desired for that to be shown in his congregation. John saw first hand the example of God's love being poured out for us by Jesus. In the darkest of times, God's love for us came in the form of the incarnated one who came and gave his life for us as the sacrifice we need. Even though we did not love God, he sent Jesus to be our sacrifice. He sent Christ to be the price for our, our sin and our feelings. Folks, we don't have the capacity to deal with just what that is all about, about what that's all like, just as we don't have the capacity to deal with our sin ourselves. Only God can do that. And he does that time and time again because of his amazing love. Even in the darkest of days, God's love does not fail. We are the ones that turn away and hurt and anger, and yet God remains because of his love. There is nothing that we can do to deserve this great love. Nothing we can ever do to pay him back for this love. But then his love doesn't ask for a receipt. This love doesn't give once and then stop. This love continues to give and love and continues to uphold and continues to strengthen the one who is receiving it. And so as a result of God's great love for us, John includes a clause then for his church fellowship to follow. If they're to show God faithfully to the world and to one another. Verses 11 and 12. Dear friends, since God so loved us, as I've just tried to explain, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And like, like lots of this, there's several things going on here. Knowing that God is all love and that Jesus is the ultimate gift of love and his death is the greatest example of love, we are tasked as being a people who bear his name, who are his children, to show that in our lives. And that, uh, that we live our lives in a different way. And through that love, our lives will be complete. And saying that since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And we ought to love one another. It's, it's the ultimate expression of truly being the church of Christ. We're, we're not going to be in a, an atoning sacrifice for one another. But we can show love in how we speak, how we act and react, how we care, how we bless one another. John goes as far to suggest that this is what people need to see. 
For if they do, then they will see God. And I get a kick out of the, the white man with the big grey beard version of God. I mean, nowhere in the scriptures is anything even closely resembling that mentioned in regards to God the Father. Instead, it's us. It's you and me who are the image bearers of God. We're made in his image. And it's through truly loving our brothers and sisters that we actually fully resemble the image of God that the world needs to see. And that's a challenge, isn't it? Who amongst us can claim that this is how we live and behave? We're not always so good at being the image of God, are we? By John's rationale, all fellowships that are truly Christian should look like that. It should be a place where there's, where there's you know, love abounding. It's no good for us to talk about it, people. Uh, it, no good for us to, to be a people who fail to show love. It's not good enough for us to be a people who talk about showing the love of God and then do nothing, anything but. It's missing the mark if that's how we live and behave. So our challenge then in all of this is to do a bit of a self-check on how we're doing. Are we harbouring feelings of resentment against someone in church? Are we feeling to show love in how we behave? Are we making life difficult for others within our fellowship? If you are, then the reality is that you're not showing the love of God in your life. You're failing. You're failing to be a true image bearer of God in the place where you're supposed to be that more than ever. Well, think about that. Are you satisfied that that's the case? You know, are you feel, are, are your feelings of resentment against others so great that you cannot let go of them? Let me ask you one question. Do you want to have God's love made complete in you? Because if you do, then you're going to have to change. And it's a process. It's part of our sanctification. But step one needs to be the realisation that we could be in a situation where we are not showing God's love in the way that we should, in the way that we've been asked. I often wonder what the church, what it would be like for the church to truly show the love of God in the way that it's described here in the scriptures. It would be a fellowship that the world would not be able to resist, I believe. One that, one that I, like John, am convinced would be the most culture-changing, world-defining, barrier-breaking and so dearly needed movement in the history of the world. You know, oftentimes the church is ruled with fear, ruled with cruelty and judgment. Too often our churches and fellowships are devoid of love. But real love is showing that gospel message of Jesus Christ has actually changed you. Has actually made you a new person. So can we, as John has urged us here, be people of real love? For now you know what that looks like. Which means there's no excuses. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. God, we need your help for all of the things that we are challenged by within the scriptures. And we need your help especially to be that people of love. Help us God to show you then in who we are and what we do. Help us to show love to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Help us to grow closer together. Help us, Lord God, to reach out to one another. Lord God, forgive us for any resentment that we may have against one another. Forgive us for any ill feelings that we harbour against one another. Help us to see and to realise, God, that through truly loving, that we actually bear your image all the better. So God, help us be your image bearers in the truest, truest possible way. Help us to be that people of love. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, as always, uh, I urge you to stay safe um, and uh, I encourage you to c continue to read the scriptures and continue to uh, use this time of lockdown to maybe do a little bit of self-analysis and all the rest of it. And uh, you'll come to a place where, where you are able to, to walk more closely with God and show him all the better in your lives. Uh, remember to tune in to our service at 10.30 on uh, Sunday morning. And then, of course, we'll have these uh these teaching series will be uh, continuing on YouTube over the next few weeks. So uh, please do uh, pray for, for one another. Pray for me as I'm praying for you. And uh, I shall uh, see you all uh, soon. So God bless.